Good morning to you. Good morning. God bless you. That was a wonderful memory. Amen. My living shall not be in vain. May God bless you. That musician, that was terrific. See, can anybody hear me? Thank you. My name is uh, Reverend Stephen C. Saunders, and I uh, am here. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to offer prayer, read some scripture, and uh, share some uh, thoughts that I've had, some notes that I have uh, as it relates to this new year, 2019. Uh, let's buy a hand for prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Creator, we thank you for allowing us to rise on a cold, windy day to come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Oh God, we thank you for your darling Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself that we might have life, and that life more abundantly. Lord, help us follow the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, and to give our full measure of service, love, and devotion to the Holy Scripture and to worship of you. And now, God, bless this time in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me just give thanks to uh, uh, Pilgrim, to the pastor. Uh, Reverend Michelle uh, Hughes, the leadership, and members, I thank you for the invitation to be here. You don't know me uh, directly, but some of you may recognize me. Regina and I have lived here for 36 years. I came to Oak Park. Uh, I was a member of Young Life, and Young Life was a youth ministry. Uh, I spent uh, some good years at Oak Park with Forest High School taking young people at Venture Academy, uh, taking them uh, to my home for Bible study, uh, for uh, hearing the word of Jesus Christ, uh, for climbing mountains in Colorado, for uh, being in Lake Saranac, uh, parasailing, uh, and to have a healthy sense of uh, the earth and a healthy connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, Reverend Glory, I appreciate you and your reception that she uh, received me. And, that, and that's very important. It's very important. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, is read uh, Michael. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is important. Uh, when I joined uh, Operation Push, I was 17 years old. It was actually Operation Red Basket at the time. Uh, it was right after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Junior. And uh, it seemed to me that there had to be a response. I was 17 uh, and, of course, going through teenage uh, uh, growth. I was just saying, we don't call it growth. And, <laughs> but I felt like I could do something. Something as a result of what Dr. King did in this life. And so I pledged uh, to work with Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson Sr. I've known him more than 50 years, met him in 1967, and uh, I'm still friends. We celebrated Christmas together, uh, just this last Christmas, and so I'm sure Reverend Jackson sends his love and blessings to this great congregation. But we used to read this at Operation Red Basket, the Reverend uh, Dr. Ed Reddick would read this, wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly, with thy God. You know, I, uh, I'm i going to require 16 hugs myself. <laughs> I, uh, so at the end of the service, I'll get back in the bag. You know, for us all you can gather around and give you 16 hugs. And we can just make, we'll start with one and we'll keep it account. I'll keep the hug, bank account, and I'll just come every week and get, you know, additional hugs. Um, I thought it was really wonderful. Uh, I celebrated Dr. King's birthday. Uh, because he was an inspirational leader, an advocate for social justice, justice, and he was, in my mind, one of the heroes of uh, my time. 
Uh, I did not meet him personally, but I remember that in Chicago, there was a Chicago Freedom Movement, and that was uh, Al Rady, uh, who invited Dr. King to come and march for open housing. For African Americans could only live in certain areas of the city of Chicago. Uh, I go to projects and I could not go to other schools because of the restrictive covenants. We could not move where we wanted. And so whatever school we went to was overcrowded because we were not allowed to live in other communities uh, or move to those communities. Uh, but Reverend Claude Nanny Wyatt, uh, Dr. John Porter, uh, Alderman, former Alderman Dorothy Tillman, Reverend Willie Barrow, uh, and Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson uh, began a campaign uh, to continue Dr. King's legacy called Operation Red Basket. And so I was one of the organizing people. Uh, as a teenager, we organized uh, the Student Federation and we went on strike against the Chicago Public Schools as uh, juniors and seniors in high school because we wanted uh, books that were new. We just didn't want to use the books that were already used. Uh, I sat in a trailer. Uh, they called them Willis Wagons. And so when you were in an overcrowded school, either you went to school in shifts, that meant I went to school from 8 to 12 and used the book, and then whoever came in hand had to use that same book from 12 to 4. And so that was the kind of education that I had in Chicago, and I thought that was pretty okay. You know, I'd have to take books home. You know, they were kind of raggedy, but it was okay. I could overlook that. Uh, it wasn't until later I realized that every student didn't have that education experience. You know, and so as a result, I decided to challenge the Chicago uh, Public School Board at that time. Uh, Dr. Matthew Bird was the uh, deputy superintendent. He was working on the segregation plan, but we decided and demanded uh, education for uh, African American and Latino students and others who had been segregated and marginalized in the city of Chicago. Dr. King agreed to come to Chicago, but he agreed for open housing because his idea was if you could live near your school, then you would not be overcrowded. And so Al Ray and the Chicago Freedom Movement had Dr. King come to Chicago. Uh, he marched all throughout Chicago, he was hit by a brick in the head uh, out in Gage Park. And uh, he had a press conference where he said he had been seeing violence in the South. And he had faced hate, but he had never faced hate quite like he faced in the city of Chicago. Now, that was remarkable because it was something that we were accustomed to. It was something I was accustomed to because if we went to the wrong neighborhood, like Bridgeport, what would happen is people would chase us away with bats and bricks, and they would be adults. And uh, we thought racial animosity was a norm, but it was not. And I learned that from Dr. King. You know, and so what I want to share with you, some of the thoughts I want to share with you, is uh, my wife and I moved here in about 2000. Uh, we had a, our youngest son, uh, Aaron, was a member of the Boy Scouts of America. And I had been a scouting dad at least three years. And so we were moving towards the end of Aaron's uh, scouting. And uh, a decision uh, came from the courts that uh, gay scoutmasters were barred from the Boy Scouts of America. Now, initially, we didn't think a lot of it, but his troop, Aaron's troop, got together. They were 10 years old, fifth grade, and they didn't like that. And so what they decided is they would protest uh, the barring of anyone as scoutmaster because they didn't feel like it was fair. And we didn't think much of it, but it became a national controversy. Uh, scout troops all across the nation at that time were charged with banning gay scout masters. And it became such uh, a problem that our scout troop wrote to the Boy Scouts of America and explained to them that they could not discriminate against anyone, that they thought the business of scouting was fair and just, and they wanted to do that, and they felt that their neighbors and friends were being targeted. Well, the Boy Scouts' response was to pull their charge and then to void their scouting abilities. 
Well, we were shocked. I'm a parent. I've been, you know, out on camping trips and I've got badges, merit badges. I bought a, a, a uniform every year. And we, we did uh, races with Pine Car Derby and Rain Devil and Goddess. And all of a sudden, I'm faced with fifth graders who decided they wanted justice. And as scouts, they would stand, they would act, and there would be a consequence because the Boy Scouts of America said, we don't want certain people and it doesn't matter what you think. And I saw the failure of adults for my fifth grader. What could I say to him? But he was trained and grew up in the civil rights tradition. His scouts, his scout pack met with Leslie Stahl from 60 Minutes and were interviewed. They were featured in a People magazine piece along with many scout groups across the nation. This was amazing stuff, but none of these children sought to be on 60 Minutes or People Magazine. They didn't, what they wanted was justice the way they understood it. And they didn't understand why the scouts could be so mean. And so that group joined Campfire Boys and Girls of America. And in 2000, we marched behind the Boy Scouts but those children at the end of their scouting career realized that justice had to be lived and there was going to be a price paid. And so they were stripped of their scouting privileges by the Boy Scouts of America. That was quite a blow for me because I had thought of the Boy Scouts as a wonderful organization, and it probably still is. I, I, I'm sure they're great. But I did not realize how non-negotiable they would be with children. It wasn't the parents that they stripped of badges and all of the ceremonies. It was the children that suffered. And that was cruel and unusual. So why is that important when we talk about Dr. King? My sons grew up in the tradition of Dr. King. Many of the children that I knew were willing to take a stand for what they believed in how could I do any less? And so we followed that to its logical conclusion. And that was an important reminder and lesson to me that justice has not prevailed in the United States of America into 2019, no more than it did in 2000 when this occurred. Michael was burdened by the abusive treatment of the poor by the rich and influential. He rebukes all social and political leaders who use their power for gain and exploitation of the poor. God calls Micah to a remarkable ministry of proclamation. And so Micah sets out to challenge people that he that was nearby, despite how they felt about him, what they said about him, how they may have disinvited him from most of the important ceremonies of the time, most important events of the time, from being recognized or distinguished, liked, or even anonymous. He knew that he had to stand and speak the word of God because God cares about everyone. He has justice in mind. And so when I talk today, the thing I think about is the leadership in America today, the leadership that separates families at the border, the leadership that allows children to die in custody of the United States of America, the leadership that has pronounced Muslims as uh, evil uh, kinds of people who don't deserve to come to the United States as though Muslims weren't in the United States, an administration that sees a giant wall physically built along our border to uh, separate us. Uh, much like in communism in the Iron Curtain, we're trying to build a new Iron Curtain in North America. And then for those of you old enough to remember the Iron Curtain, when the Iron Curtain fell, and I'm old enough to remember this, it was an amazing thing because it brought the Germanies together. There was an East Germany and the West Germany. And they were separated by a wall. And so in 2019, our leadership has a regressive vision to build a new wall 
to signify our fear and our failure to love and connect with those of our neighbors to the south. Dr. King, I would imagine, would have a lot to do and a lot to say. Because Dr. King was a person who moved not only by boycotts, demonstrations, and civil disobedience, but he struck at the very laws and the Constitution of the United States. And a lot of times when we celebrate Dr. King, what gets lost is Dr. King used constitutional principles to indict America who was not living up to the Constitution that it itself made us pledge allegiance to. How many of you are old enough to remember that we would stand up in the morning and go to school and we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. That was something we did every day. And then we would say the national anthem. We did it without knowing what we were really committing ourselves to. And we were told if we were good citizens, if we had good behavior in school, and I listen to the young people talk about school, don't wear your hats in school, you know, you're not, and I would wear my hat to school. Keep it on. And when I thought nobody was looking, the teacher would just jerk it right off my hand. We find ourselves in a time and an era where cruelty is accepted and expected, that we can be publicly cruel to people who are not us and be celebrated in social media, create talk shows, raise money. It is the most remarkable phenomenon I have ever come across. It is self-centeredness at its greatest. It serves a very few people and is destroying the lives of many. And we must, as a faith community, stand, as Dr. King did, and do our part to say, like my son did, we will not allow you to hurt our neighbors, and we'll take off the uniform that you gave us and put on a new one, because we're not going to do anything but work for justice. If my 10-year-old could do that, how could his father do any less? How could his father look at him and say, son, I spent all this money. Son, I spent all this time. You've got all these badges. You're moving on in school. Our reputation needs to be maintained because my friends are asking me, why would I accept a gay scoutmaster? And I got very tired of me explaining any of it. I was like, you know what? I'm a scout. I'm confident in the leadership of the scouts. And nobody is going to discriminate. And I'm not going to put my son in a situation where he is unjust. Mm -hmm. Not going to do it. Just not going to do it. Now, we paid a crop. It was a heavy price for us. Because then there was a separation of the children. The children of the scout families and the children of the campfire families. Can you imagine that? Marching side by side as adversaries in a parade in a park in the world. It was horrible. And yet it was necessary because there needed to be a sign that there was justice here in the village of Oak Park. Who was that got to do with uh, the discussion by the prophet? How does that make any sense? Whatever. Well, let me just read a couple of, this is just an observation, a couple of definitions. One is, what does the Lord really require of us? Because in the, the text, the person wants to come and bow before the Most High God. And he wants to know, or she wants to know, God, what will it take to bow before you, to be connected to you, to serve you, to worship you? What will it take? What degree of faith must I use? So, my sermon title is, interestingly enough, I forgot this, I'm just going to read Faith in the Third Degree. And degrees are important because it's a measurement. If you want to know how cold or how hot it is outside, by Fahrenheit or Celsius, you talk about degrees. 
And when my wife bakes cookies, she bakes by degrees. And if the degrees are off, the cookies either are overbaked or they're underbaked. And so you want the degree to be steady. And you want those cookies, for those of you who like cookies as much as I do, you want those cookies to be fresh and hot. And so degrees are very important. Another way to think about degrees is when we're in school, we aspire to go to college and we're bestowed a degree. Uh, Associate of Arts, Bachelor of Arts, Masters of Arts, perhaps a doctorate. Dr. King achieved in his time what many people did not achieve. He met the highest degree of education in his field at a very young age and assumed pastorship of a great church. But he found himself in a dilemma. He found himself in segregation. He found that Rosa Parks sat on the bus and refused to move because African Americans there were made to get up and give their seats to the white transit riders. And that was unjust. He was a young pastor, but he got involved and the Montgomery bus boycott was remarkable in the scope because after a year, the Montgomery Transit Authority decided that everyone could ride and no one would give up their seats. And that began the civil rights movement, the modern day civil rights movement for many of us. Mercy is compassion and forgiveness for one who has the power to punish. So that's an important distinction. You see, some people have in their power the ability to punish us, sometimes very justly, because sometimes we're just wrong. But mercy is when we go and say, have mercy upon me. Do not treat me as harshly as I deserve. Please give me compassion. And so that's what God wants, compassion. He wants mercy. Justice, fairness, the lack of prejudice. This is a concept of law that says that everyone should be treated fair, equally, and in a balanced way. From humility, that's modesty, the lack of self-importance, living before God in a simple way. And that's what God requires of me today. So, 50 years later, I find that Dr. King represented the finest of Christian traditions for me. And when I joined, I not only joined a civil rights movement, I joined a spiritual movement that changed America. So much so that I had a chance to celebrate the first African American president of the United States uh, President Barack Obama. My wife and I did voter registration on the west side and we worked very hard, not because he was African American, but we thought he was the best candidate for the job. And so my son today can look and see that he could be president or his, my niece, she could be president of the United States of America if she employs the right methods. And that's fairness in this country. What is important, as I come to a close, and I bet you guys are just happy to see me stand and you'll be happy for me to be seated. <laughs> Michael did not shy away from controversy. And as Christians, we cannot shy away from controversy because controversy is spiritual in its nature. When people are agitated and angry, as Herod was when he learned that Jesus was uh, born, what happens is the wicked are not comfortable. And that is the spiritual power that God gives us, is to make the wicked uncomfortable. Now you say, well, that's kind of negative. That's not negative. God wants justice, mercy, and humility. And for those powers that are not, it is my job to be a Christian and to make you uncomfortable. And if you're not uncomfortable, I'm not doing my job. 
And so I can't go to God and say, well, God, what should I do? Now, I told you what you should do. But I'll give you the power to do it and to live through every aspect of it. And thank God, 50 years later, he had. He's given me the power to stand before this August body and declare to you that Jesus saves and that Jesus saves to the uttermost. The Lord Jesus saved me. He preserved me. He guided me. And I did not have to set him aside to meet the requirements that God has laid out for me. That is why I joined Operation Breadbasket. There were a lot of movements, some were socialists, the Black Panther Party, some were separatists, the Nation of Islam, and I'm not against them. But I needed a way to use my faith to make a difference in this world. I didn't get wealthy, I didn't get influential, but what I did get was satisfaction. I am satisfied today that God has taken me in the right path. And I feel empowered to continue to serve. I'm not burned out. I'm not upset. Wherever the powers that be are now, they won't last always. And I am confident in that today. Today's political and wealthy people have withheld justice and mercy from the immigrant, from the Muslim, from the Mexican, for those in need of health care, those in need of their livelihood, they have a government shutdown. And people cannot even go to work because people are so selfish and have decided that they would use them as pawns. 800,000 people are being used as pawns to build a nonsensical wall. And I'll call it nonsensical. And I hope people tell me. I think it's nonsense. There are nations and global globally wealthy people, a journalist was murdered. And people think the Prince of Saudi Arabia, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, ordered that murder. And the response was, well, we do business with Saudi Arabia. That is not a spiritual response, that is a wicked response. And the Christian community needs to stand and say, whether that man was Muslim, whether that man was Christian, agnostic, he did not deserve to be murdered. And that our leadership cannot follow a murderer or a set of murderers because we're doing business with them. That means nothing to God. And it certainly doesn't mean anything to me. Jesus healed and delivered those who were not really deserved. You know what I love about the gospel of Jesus Christ is some of us got saved and we thought we deserved that. But I realized that I'm a wretched man. That the Lord hung and died for me, not because I was good, but because he was good. Yeah. The Lord Jesus Christ gave of himself. He became flesh. He sweated. He felt pain. He was rejected. And he did that to be in the will of his Father, who wanted all of us to be able to approach the throne as we're doing today. To worship God in spirit and in truth. Finally, what does God want from us? Why does he even say that kind of thing? Is it something that we can do? Jesus brought the salvation and promise of life eternal by humbly submitting himself to the degradation of execution for crimes he never committed. Jesus was executed for crimes he never committed. In our justice system, there are many people who are serving time and they have not committed the crime, but the evidence has been stacked against them. That's the kind of world that we're in today. And so, as I hasten to my seat, the work of Dr. King and the richness of the Lord Jesus Christ calls on all of us to answer and act on this question. Wherewith shall I come and bow before the Lord? the Most High God. May God bless you and may God keep you. Amen.